Sometimes, as a minister of the gospel, you develop things and, and messages, and they take weeks, months, sometimes years. Sometimes you read a scripture, and it just comes alive and goes, you need to share that this week. And that's what happened to me this week. So this was right out of my Bible reading. And uh, it's kind of funny. I, I, Bryden got me into this Bible reading plan this year where uh, these guys, they're amazing artists, and they do these cartoon intros to each book of the Bible. And by that, I mean it's, it's, it's really cool. I mean, you, you just have to see it. But, like, they're, they're giving you an overview of the chapter, and they're drawing pictures, and it's just coming alive on your screen, like right here. It's the craziest thing I've ever seen, and it's amazing. Well, in, in the New Testament, they break it down. At, like, I'm almost watching a video introduction almost every chapter. And at first, I was like, man, this is going to make me take longer. And then you're like, shame on you, Mr. Davis. So it takes you a little longer. This is good stuff. And out of that, that's what happened this week. And I was like, it's a thought that I've always thought about, but I didn't always have the scripture to back it up. So just let me share this. But I've never preached this scripture before that I know of, ever. But I've read the story a million times, literally. And, and you're going to be very familiar with it. But it's what came out of it for me this week that I was like, that explains a lot. Today we're going to be looking at the last of the parables in Luke chapter 7. Jesus was ministering in various ways to those in need of healing, even healed a child of a Roman soldier, and it's an excellent chapter. So for your homework, I would like you to read Luke chapter 7 this week and really read all the stories. This is the last one, but there's a bunch of them. And if you want to know what Jesus was like, you'll see it in this chapter. But today we're going to look at Luke 7, 36 through 50, and I'm going to read a little bit, talk a little bit, read a little bit, so Brian, you can just leave it up there, whatever, it doesn't really matter, but we're going to find Jesus meeting in the home of a Pharisee. Everybody say Pharisee. Church person. There's a difference in church people and Christians. You can be very churched and very unchrist like that's good preaching. Now, you ain't going to like it. But I've seen some very Christ-like people that don't really go to church. And I've seen some very unchristlike people go every Sunday. Did I just say that? Can we edit that? That probably shouldn't be on YouTube. I've said it before. Kim, you know it's true. Sometimes you, there's some of the nicest people in the world go to church every Sunday. And they sit right next to some of the meanest people in the world. Now you figure out which one your neighbor is and which one you are. That's up to you. <laughs> it's just truth. Listen to me. Folks, the Pharisees were practicing all the religious stuff. They were strict, man. They, were, they, they, they followed the law. They, they, they did all the rituals. They did all the stuff. But they didn't do Jesus. And so that's the house he's at. That's a very important part of the story. So when one of the Pharisees invited Jesus to have dinner with him, I'm sure he did it for the show. Okay, I probably don't believe you're the Messiah, but if you are, I'm going to have you at my house, and I'm going to look better with the other religious church folks. He went to the Pharisee's house and reclined at the table. I like that word. I'm going to start reclining at my table, see what Marisa thinks. Probably won't go well for me. <laughs> a woman in that town who lived a sinful life. Everybody say sinful life. She wasn't church. She was a sinner. Known sinner. Far from God. Sinner. That Jesus was eating at the Pharisee's house, so she came there with an alabaster jar of perfume. I told you, you've heard this story. I've never preached this story. As she stood behind him at, the, at his feet weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears, then she wiped them with her hair. Think about that. Anybody want to take a shot, ladies? Who does that? 
Who comes to the feet of a person and cries so hard that they're able to wet his feet and then dry them with their hair? That's a crazy story, folks. Almost unbelievable. Except it's told, I think, in almost every gospel. She kissed them and poured perfume on them. When the Pharisee, the church guy, who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, if this man were a prophet, see, he didn't believe, he would know who is touching him and what kind of woman she is. She is a sinner. Religious people can't let sinners touch them. Boy, it's going to get good. I can see by the look on your faces. Jesus is ministering to a Pharisee. But this known sinner came in, wept at his feet. And the Pharisee's response is very telling. He's offended that she's even there. Sometimes church people can find themselves offended as well. Sometimes at those around who have not received Christ. Sometimes even those who have. Now folks, track with me today. This is an important teaching I'm giving you. And it will determine the future of the bridge. I'm not going to lie and tell you I'm never appalled at some of the blatant sinners in our world and how they just, whatever they do, and, and you just kind of get sickened at it. I get it. I, I, I'm not saying that's not going to happen, okay? There, there are certain people that want to flaunt their sin and their debauchery in front of us to make statements, and I'm not cool with that. I'm not. I get that. But in reference to their condition before God, how we respond is very important. It's, it's, it's everything. Doesn't mean we have to join them in their parade. But we got to pray and hope for opportunity to tell them some truth. Verse 40, Jesus answered him, Simon, I have something to tell you. Bridge family, I got something to tell you. Tell me, teacher, he said. Two people owed money to a certain money lender. One owed him 500 denarii and the other 50. Neither of them had the money to pay him back, so he forgave the debts of both of them. Now, which of them will love him more? Simon, the Pharisee, replied, I suppose the one who had the bigger debt forgiven. You have judged correctly, Jesus said. Jesus is explaining this paradoxical relationship with Jesus thing that's going on. If you were a real bad sinner and Jesus met you and came into your life, your love for Jesus is probably going to be a little bit stronger because you've been forgiven of more than the guy that was saved Third grade. I never thought about that before. Oh, I've thought about it. Like, how do some people seem to have more compassion and mercy for sinners than others? Well, probably because they've been forgiven of a bunch of stuff. And I don't care that you were saved in third grade and you've never done all that stuff. But sometimes it reflects in the lack of compassion for sinners. Because you've never experienced this stuff. You don't know why anybody would do that. You should look at it and say, thank you, God. And your love should be just as great, should be greater in my opinion, that you never did that stuff. He saved you from it. But sometimes those are some of those kind of cranky Christians. I knew this was going to go over great. I'm glad I'm amongst sinners. I think you get what I'm saying. 
Listen to me. This is important stuff. Because if you're a cranky Christian, you need an attitude adjustment. If you're a judgmental church person, you need an attitude adjustment. I love you. I just think how we respond to the world is very telling. I don't know where to go with some of this because I don't know how much you can handle. Last Sunday after church, Pastor Mark and I had been invited to a guy's house where he told us, you know, there are going to be a bunch of non-church people there and they're going to be doing their thing. What people do when they watch football games, there'll be some food and some drinking and some whatever. And so I asked Pastor Mark, are you going? He said, yep, but he didn't. (laughs) He got sick. It's okay. And I didn't know he'd been sick all week. He didn't tell me. Last Sunday when he was here, he did not feel good. But he came and did his thing because that's how much he loves you. But he went home and went to bed. He, he was sick. So I show up. And I rode my motorcycle so I could fit in a little better. There were a couple of Harleys and some hot rods and some jacked up Jeeps and trucks. And I thought, all right, I can blend. Most of them were Browns fans. And I wore my Joe Burrow jersey for the Bengals. Well, really well. But I told him, I said, if we come, you cannot introduce us as pastors. Just let us be your friend, Randy and Mark. And he did that. And you know, because he didn't call me his pastor or label me as his pastor friend, I was able to talk to everybody there and there was no religious jargon. It was amazing. And we were talking football and at least I know a little bit about that and And I was able to bust her chops because, I mean, the Bengals did win. (laughs) Sorry. But but it it was that time I was sitting there thinking to myself, this is where we need to be. We shouldn't shun those people. I didn't partake of what they were partaking of, but I was able to be there and and to be who I am and love on those people. And one guy goes, you going to come back and we do another one? I said, yeah, if, if I get invited. They're like, it's an open invitation. Okay. Now, if they didn't know I was pastor, you know what happened? Lockjaw. Or I'd have heard all their religious stories of why they hate God and me. So I tell you, don't introduce me as your pastor. I'm just Randy, your friend. We need to be having more gatherings in our homes that includes not only our church family, we need to bring some people that need Jesus. And it's okay to be around people that don't know Jesus because they're a prayer away from being one of the most grateful Christians that you'll ever meet. This is important, folks. I think one of the things that happens sometimes when you're in church a while is you get church, but you don't get more loving. You get, you get rules and regulations, but you don't get more caring and compassionate. I don't want to lose that. Jesus was the most loving, caring, compassionate soul that ever walked the face of the earth. And he said, go and do likewise. Are we? Are we only compassionate to people that are like us? I'm not good with whiners and complainers. I'm really not. I'm a suck it up, buttercup, let's go kind of guy. That's why I don't have a lot of them in our church. I'm not real compassionate with that. Shame on me. They probably need Jesus too. I don't know. I don't know what they need. You can't tell. They change every day. This is terrible. (laughs) I'm going to get voted out. (laughs) Folks, we all have pet things that drive us crazy. I'm not good with know-it-alls either. You, You bring up any subject and they're an expert. It's like, really? You ain't that smart. Come on. Or you're in conversation, and I've done this. I'm guilty, I, I, and I don't like being like this. But sometimes somebody tells a story, and you one-up them. And they tell a story, you one-up them. I hate that. I try to control that. God, shut my mouth. I don't want to be that guy because I don't like that guy. Isn't it funny how we are? And we, 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 we look at a person, and just by their appearance, 
They think they're all that. How do you know? They may actually have a low self-esteem, and they're just trying to keep their head up to walk around. You won't know if you don't get to know them. Why do we prejudge church? How do we treat somebody when they walk through that door and they look different than us? Of course, we're a motley crew. It's going to be kind of hard to find somebody different than us. And I love that about this. That's, that's the thing that makes it great. I don't see Steve. I can't picture you looking down your nose at people. Why? Because he shared a couple weeks ago how grateful he is that God saved him out of the hell that he was in. And that's what we all need to have is that thankfulness, that gratefulness. Oh, God, thank you. Why? Because he's forgiven much. But those who've been forgiven little, if you keep on reading, and I won't, but it goes on down to say those who've been forgiven little, love little. How's your love today? Is it big? Because God's forgiven big? Or is it little because you only got forgiven a little? I mean, let's face it. If I say to John, I'm at, I'm at McDonald's and Ada, and John happens to be there, and I'm going to come up short. Hey, John, can you give me a couple bucks to get my Big Mac? Oh, Randy, I got you, man. Here, Forget about it. I'm probably not going to send him a card and say thanks because if he was there, I'd do the same thing, right? I mean, it's a couple of bucks. But what if John came to me and said, hey, how much you owe on your mortgage? I'm planting seed, John. <laughs> now I say 150000 He goes, well, me and the wife have been praying about this. We want to pay that off for you. It's a funny little story, but think about it. John's probably going to get a card. He's probably going to get a hug. He's probably going to get taken out to Old City Prime. <laughs> just telling you, John, just step up. <laughs> I might even send him on a bed and breakfast vacation somewhere fancy. Why? Because that's a big debt. And that's what this is all about. I had a football player ask me, why do you love me so much? Because when I was where you are, people loved me that much. Or I wouldn't be here. Well, you don't even know me. I don't have to know you. And it blows their minds. Like, this guy really cares. He don't even know my name. I can't learn all their names. I've tried. I gave up. I just call them, you're number 63, aren't you? Okay, hey, 63, how you doing today? I, I'm done. I'm done. I'm old. But one of those same kids that asked me a couple of years ago, he's now a senior. He was texting me last night. He's really discouraged, going through a really tough time. We were texting back and forth. And I said, man, I just thank you for trusting me to hear you. He goes, I trust you more than anyone I know. <laughs> Listen to me. I love that kid because people loved me when I was a mess. And I don't ever, I prayed the day that I recommitted my life to Christ in the altar at my home church over here on this side, at the end of the altar. I said, God, don't ever let me forget where you came, where I came from. Don't ever let me forget how lost I felt before today. Because I don't want to be a crusty Christian. I don't want to be cranky. I don't want to be nasty and judgmental. I want to love people, genuinely true love people. And I'm going to tell you something, the world can pay, they can tell the difference. Kids can tell the difference. If you're mean and cranky, kids will look at you and go, I might start doing that. And if I'm mean and cranky, you should do it to me. Because we can all do it. None of us are above this. I'm not preaching at you. I'm preaching at us. We got to do better. True love starts with remembering the debt's been paid. Now, 
If you've not let Jesus pay your debt, you have no idea what I'm talking about. Because you can't. Until you've asked Jesus to come into your heart and he's freed you of your sins and totally cleansed you of all your unrighteousness, you can't understand what I'm talking about. You feel the goodness of a a connected church, a church that loves Jesus. We try to worship him. We try to love each other. You can feel all that, but you can't genuinely feel true love until you accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior. And you can be a great person. I know a lot of great people don't love Jesus. And they're nicer than some of the Christians I've been talking about today. A lot nicer. That's why they don't like the church. It's mean people. I'm so sick of hearing that. It's got to be over. The day and time we're living in, the world needs the church to come out of this building with the love of Jesus all over us. Is anybody listening? That was an amen moment. Unless you're just determined you're stuck in your ways and you just can't change and it's just who I am. It's how God made me. No, he didn't. You liar. You're crusty because you ain't listening to Jesus. I had a guy tell me, if you don't like my grumpiness, just deal with it, because that's who I am. I said, well, if you'd have a come to Jesus meeting, he could change who you am. Well, he was so mad at me. I don't care. I, I don't care. If that's offensive to you, who's right? You, of course. Not. Listen, folks, I had a football player yesterday at the game. I'm known to do things yelling at refs. He came to me, fear and trembling, put his arm around me, and he said, Pastor, can I say something to you today before this game? And I said, yeah, man, what's up? He goes, I know you like to yell at the refs, but he said, you're an authority figure on our team. And when you do that, you give some of our guys that are less connected to our team an excuse to blame the rest for however it goes. And I just felt like I needed to tell you that today. And he was shaking, telling me this, Chris. It was serious. Like he, he had thought about this a lot. And I looked at him and I said, man, thank you. I am not above being called out. He goes, I was scared to death to say anything. He said, but you don't understand. Once you do something, everybody starts doing it. And then, and then it's like that becomes our excuse. And we don't need any excuses today. Whew. Luke, that'll preach. <laughs> wow. So I didn't yell at refs yesterday because he stood right behind me the whole game. What's your deal? <laughs> Would you go somewhere? <laughs> Keeping me accountable. I did have one instance where the ref had thrown a flag that was a very bad flag, and we were all pretty mad about it, and he forgot it. And he went 20 yards down the field, and I picked it up. And I thought, well, he probably needs it, so I went to throw it. Well, the next play had already started. And as I throw it to him, he turns around, and I almost, I almost hit him with his own flag, and I almost got a flag. And then they had to wave it off because they said it wasn't a flag. Because I did throw it at the ref on the field. I mean, it looked like a flag. And all the people were like, what'd they call? (laughs) And as I'm leaving, every person I know from that team, their parents from Alan E, Shawnee, everybody, hey, Randy, did you throw the flag at that ref? How'd you see that? (laughs) What is it? Be sure your sins will find you out. Listen, folks, I'm glad that kid said something to me. I thanked him two or three times, and I said, don't ever hesitate. If you feel you need to correct me, I'm correctable. I stood corrected yesterday. Thank God he had the courage to do that. That took a lot. Folks, I love you enough to tell you the truth. Because there's somebody in Allen County or Mercer County or Hallglaze County or Hardin County or whatever county you live in that needs you to be Jesus in their life. You're the only one that can reach them. They won't listen to a preacher. They don't like preachers. They like you. Use that influence 
to truly love them with the love that only Jesus can give you. We gave out blessing bags. And Ruth, I've thought about this. And Scott, you guys had the idea. And I thought, you know, I hope a farmer that's discouraged or, or one of their helpers maybe having a bad day, when they got that blessing bag and they read that little card, something said, wow, somebody does care. That's what I prayed for those bags. Just that they'd be just a witness of a, a care, an ounce of love from strangers and candy. That speaks volumes, doesn't it? Somebody hands you a little snack bag and we love you, thinking about you. It's that simple. Tonight it'll be handing out candy and tracks and stuff to kids. Next week we kind of reload by just fellowshipping and having chili together and breaking bread and sitting around bonfires, scaring people on hayrides, stuff like that. Listen, we need each other. And some of you are really good at loving others because you know your debt's been paid and it was big. But even if it's only a little, think about what he kept you from and let that motivate you. The debt that he paid is the same. Some of us had to go in it and come out of it. Some of you never went in it. But the debt that was paid was the same. We've got to learn how to be thankful and use that to show greater love and greater compassion to other people. And that's my message today. I don't want us to get lost in thinking, I've arrived, or who. If you knew who was touching you, man, you would tell her to get away. <laughs> lady wants to cry on my feet and kiss them and wipe them with their hair. I'm, I'm good. <laughs> you don't know where she's from. <laughs> Who cares? That feels pretty good. <laughs> now, actually, I don't want you touching my feet, and I'll be honest with you. <laughs> but Marisha loves it. She'll come up and just stick her foot up on me one night and bottle of lotion. <laughs> yes, dear. I'm done. <laughs> Pouting. Her dad did it every night. He spoiled her rotten, and I got to do it when we get married. I'm like, what's up with you? I called him. I said, Nick, you, you did a bad thing. <laughs> Listen, God loves you. But he didn't just love you to feel loved. He loved you to love others. And there's a lot of unlovable people out there that we need to show the love of Jesus to. May God help us. And if you're one of those people that still hadn't received the love of Jesus and felt the experience of your debt being forgiven, I'm telling you, you're a prayer away from it. And you will become one of the most compassionate, loving people ever. Because that's what God does for us. Let's stand. Father, I thank you for your word. And I know you birthed this into me this week. And I just felt so compelled to share this morning this, this word. And, Lord, not to condemn anybody. We're all guilty. But, Lord, just to remind us that you've forgiven some of us of a lot of stuff. And we should never, ever take your salvation, your payment of our debt for granted. And God, if we've grown cold to it, let today be a reminder. And for those, Lord, that have served you most of their life and they've not done a lot of crazy stuff and they haven't been through some stuff that others have, and God, remind them what you saved them from and kept them from. And make us all so grateful for our salvation, for our experience with you. And let us be a church full of true love and compassion for others. Because, Lord, our world needs it today now more than ever. And we have what it takes. Help us to use it, to love on, to help, to bless others. 
In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. I love you. That's why I try to tell you the truth. I know I'm sarcastic. I'm not mad at anybody. I hope you understand that. I'm really not. But let's take who God has made us and use it to tell others about him. Amen? That's it. We're done. Have a great day. God bless you.